Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be sitting here next to an eminent journalist and an author of a great book which we'll be talking about a little later. Uh, you see, in uh, Guru Granth Sahib, Guru Amar Das Ji says, Babya Kahaniya Potus Put Krayan. What it means is that the worthy learn from their forefathers. Before I come to the book, let me talk about this gentleman sitting to my left. He has a great legacy. He is the son of Gani Gurdet Singh Ji, immortalized because of his great book, Mera Pind. And his mother, Dr. Inderjeet Kaur Sandhu, was the first lady vice chancellor in this region, or maybe in the entire country. So, and this book which he has authored is also dedicated to Gyani Ji. Now, sir, you written a great book and I have this book, I have gone through this book and I know that this is a work of in-depth research and it is an invaluable contribution to the Sikh heritage literature. Now, please tell me about this journey of writing this book and uh, how did you go about it? Because I, I, as I understand, every book is a immortal child of the author. Because, you know, the children go away, but the books stay, like Mera Pint stays. And this book, which Guru Nanak, his life and teachings will stay. So kindly tell us something about the book. How did you think about this book? Thank you so, so much for the question and uh, thank you to the organization for inviting me over. As far as the book goes, it was a very mundane kind of a start. I'm a journalist and uh, I was asked to write the book. So there was no inspiration, there was no bolt of lightning coming from anywhere. It was the pressure, gentle and firm pressure of my publisher who invited me to write the book after I had finished an earlier one on Marshall of the Indian Air Force at Dinsing. So I agreed to write it. And you know, when I came back home, uh, our house had different libraries. My mother had a library, my father had his library, which was a building, and I had my library. So my mother took out 32 books from her library on Guru Nanak Dev Ji and said, son, you got to read these before you start. I was not happy. <laughs> but that's how it started. And as I realized very soon that to make a difference, I had to write something that was accessible, that the only thing I could bring to uh, the table for my readers was an accessible book in which I wrote in a simple language and tried to condense things. And believe me, that's really, really difficult. Because it's so easy to carry on and it's so difficult to condense things. You have to get to the truth of things before you do, but that's how it all started. And then the journey began, it's still continuing. The fact is that uh, compositions of Guru Nanak have been recorded very faithfully. Most of us are aware of that fact. But Guru Nanak never wrote anything or never left anything particular about his own life or his teachings. And uh, it is the others who later on followed that. So the fidelity of whatever is available and whatever you must have gone into and the research which you carried out uh, to make it appear as if it is authentic because I have gone through this book, there is so much of research which has gone into this. Uh, how did you go about sifting, sorting out the data, information, so much that is available on Guru Nanak? How did you go about it, sir? The old-fashioned way, way by rolling up my sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you just go through it and also you realize that at certain periods of time, certain opinions became popular and then at a different period of time, a different interpretation was given. And with the benefit of hindsight, which is always 2020, you could look at all these things and see if there were certain cultural or other influences that had 
tainted the sort of process at a particular time. I'm sure people will look at my book at a later stage and feel the same way, but that's the way, you know, the whole dialectic goes. But that is what it was. It was just, you know, getting down to it. And of course, I was immeasurably, immeasurably helped by the fact that I had my father right next to me. So I could just ask him something and he'd explain it to me. I mean, that, that cut down my research because I could borrow from him. So that is a gratitude which I must acknowledge. Actually, I know writing any book takes a lot out of you. And when you write a book on as great a human being as Guru Nanak Dev Ji, then it must have been a learning and humbling experience for you also. Absolutely. You must have gone through that. You see, uh, you are talking about the perspiration which is involved with the book. I am reminded of Red Smith, Reed, Reed Smith, <laughs> who wrote, he says, writing is very easy. All you have to do is to sit next to a typewriter till little drops of blood appear on your forehead. It is that easy. So you have gone through that process of it being that easy. Uh, now, sir, in, in today's world, the principles of Guru Nanak, oneness of God, universal brotherhood, these principles, where do you see how these are being, you know, uh, used? How are these being propagated, talked about? And is it not a fact that the youngest religion, perhaps, the best of every religion included in this, yet this is also a fact that out of 800 crore population of the world, we have a population of 3 crore 6. What do you have to say about this? Let's start with Guru Nanak's philosophy, the oneness. The very concept of Ikonkar takes us to oneness and you see it all pervasive. When you look at Guru Nanak's work, you see him trying to bridge the gaps, to say that there is only one God at a time when people were fighting over, this is my God and that's your God and mine is better than yours. And he's saying there's only one God. Then he says, Kudat Ke Sabbande, so we are all similar oneness amongst us but it's our fitrat so to say that we constantly concentrate on the differences which are minor and ignore the massive similarities that we have with each other as human beings as creatures of the god and by focusing on differences we lead ourselves as astray and the concept of otherness comes in. Otherness is how we demonize the other. We don't have any other. We are the same. So where's the other? Similarly, if you sort of look at Guru Nanak's philosophy, it, it is so attractive because he has clarified it for us. He has taken us away from duality that sort of bedevils us. And we have to remember Guru Nanak was born in Punjab, but that Punjab is also now in Pakistan. And he was certainly not of Punjab, he was of the world. He reached out, he debated. You know, we talk of the Socratic method, you have him debating with religious people, with religious leaders, with common people not preaching from a pulpit, but debating with them, bringing them out their viewpoint, absorbing what they say, and presenting what he has to say. And that's how you really change people's mind, not by thrusting things upon them, but by gently guiding them in the right direction. And that's what Guru Nanak's philosophy brought for all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You see, uh, as I understand, Guru Nanak Dev Ji used different methods to put his met method across. Humor, even sarcasm somewhere, and even admonishing people who would not listen to him the way he, 
what have you to say about that, sir? The kind of method which he used, maybe at that point of time, these were the best methods and that society which he used to put his method across, their message across. No, no, at any point of time, I mean, these are methods that work. <laughs> and what, what works is something that shakes you out, out of complacency. If you're throwing water towards your fields in Katarpur, you are symbolically and practically showing the difference there is between, you know, thinking of what is possible and what is uh, not possible. If you are, uh, if your feet are invertently positioned towards the Kaaba and you tell the Qadi, point out the place where there's no God, you made your point. I mean, it's not as if the whole world will go and is going to rotate. Just look at it conceptually. You made a point. You have used the tools that are available to you to open up somebody's mind. And frankly, that's all you need to do. Uh, Sikhism, we all know, is a way of life. Isn't it? And certain practices which are there, and we have seen during COVID, especially as a matter of fact, I first time I heard the word was the Langar Seva we all have heard about, but medicine Seva, oxygen Seva and everything else, it has raised the stature of the Sikhs in the entire world to such a level that everyone now looks up to a Sikh. If there is a problem, there is a difficulty, people look up to him that he or she will help us out. Uh, what do you say about this Seva which Guru Nanak Sahib was the one who gave us and it's such a great blessing and the gift which we have. You know, in the last session, Charanji Ji was talking about how we soon acquire a great deal of hubris about what we are and we start measuring ourselves in materialistic terms. That's human. The antidote to that is seva, is selfless service of others. And when they were talking, I was reminded of this time uh, when there was an earthquake uh, in San Francisco. And it, immediately the Sardars of the area, and we are talking of 80s when I was there, landed up there with the, their vans and some longer food, which wasn't well received because people didn't know what it was. The next day they changed the menu. The seva was still there. Now it was the kind of stuff that people wanted. It became a soup kitchen. So, uh, when you look at the way Langar with Guru Nanak starts at Kartarpur, which is further sort of uh, given shape by Guru Angad and is today an integral part of Sikhism, uh, is also the biggest uh, force we have to project the Sikh soft power, as I like to call it the way our community can come up and stand together we do it so well and we do it without any expectation we are not trying to preach our religion we're just doing it to help our fellow beings and that is so well received pangat sitting together trying to dissolve caste differences again a tremendous endeavor to bring people together, again, relating to that oneness and moving us away from differences. I mean, these are the institutions which the Guru created, from which we benefit today and we will continue to benefit, our coming generations will continue to benefit. Thank you, uh, Guru Nanak vehemently condemned karamats and miracles. His karamat was that a single man in those days started walking to change the world and walked 50,000 miles in his those wooden khadava and went around and reformed the world. Now, there is so much in Sakhis and various other places, you know, written about the miracles about associated with Guru Nanak. I don't think Guru Nanak uh, ever uh, you know, performed any miracle or even thought about any kind of miracles. What do you say about that? Uh? You know, when I was young, I asked 
Sardar Kapoor Singh ICS the same question. And I said, what's our Sikh viewpoint on miracles? He said, we don't perform them. Gurus were not madaris to perform miracles. Yet, let's not forget that they were men of God. A miracle could have happened simply because they were there. You cannot discount it. You cannot at the same time try and say that they performed miracles because if you look at Sikh history, consciously whenever the Mughals were, let's take Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji, he was asked to perform a miracle and he would be spared. He did not. The Gurus did not perform miracles on demand. But they themselves, their teachings, they created a situation which was miraculous. And that's what I would feel more. And when we talk of Janam Sakhis, <coughs> there's so much in them and there are embellishments. And it's for us to receive what is in consonance with the Guru's teaching and not to receive what is not in consonance with the Guru's teaching. Uh, in this connection, may I mention that there is a you know an autograph uh, autobiography of a yogi uh, by Parmananda uh, Yogananda Parmansa. There is a chapter laugh miracle, and where he is explained that how it is possible to not perform miracles but do miracles, how the things can happen. So I leave it at that. Uh, I just want to submit at the end. I have been commissioned by a publisher, with your permission, sir, uh, to uh, write a book on Guru Nanak Ji and about Sikh faith. The name of the book is All One Must Know About the Sikh Faith. The idea is I have always felt that true Sikhism has not been understood properly. Guru Nanak Dev Ji was seen as a religious teacher, which he was not. He was more of a spiritual leader and a reformer. And this message needs to go to the people, that he was not a religious teacher. Maybe that is one of the reasons that his great message, which is, I think, very much required in today's tritone world, I mean, see, I am uh, sorry to even mention that what happened in Punjab yesterday, one was seeing <coughs> the visual on TV. Now, in this kind of world, I suppose the passage of Guru Nanak, of universal mother, um, there are many reasons why the Sikh heritage must be understood and it must be read. But perhaps the most important reason is of love and, you know, tranquility to make people instruments of peace rather than anything else. Your last words, sir, about uh, Thank you. Book. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thank you so much. This is the great book which I feel is a invaluable contribution to the Sikh uh, heritage, uh, you know, literature by Rupinder Singh Ji. And I thank him for giving this book to the Sikhs. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause, please?